Hey, welcome to Minor Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And we are two industrial designers in the big city. Sweating the small stuff. Is that the new thing now? I I feel like we've done that the past three episodes. I just can't help myself but do something after we say the tagline. Um, Uh, Brought to you this week in 4K audio. Yes, we are here. We are recording. Apologies for last week. Let me just check. As I say that, we are recording. Definitely recording. We've double checked at least 10 times in the past three minutes. Um, But yeah. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Do you have any uh, updates, James? I went to a concert last night. How was it? It was great. Snail Mail, do you know of them? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, listen. What kind of of music is it? If you don't know Snail Mail, this is... (laughs) They have have somewhat of a 90s rock retro vibe. Uh, More of like the college rock scene from the early 90s, I would say. If if that's accurate, but okay. I would check it out. It's really good. I think they're, they're like blink 182 or no, that's like early two thousands. Oh, man, that's our, <laughs> that's our slight age gap again, James. Um, but snail mail, um, is a great band. And I think that their debut album lush was one of the best albums last year from start to finish. It, it could be, a perfect album. That's a bold statement. Uh, that is so a bold I statement. would definitely, I would highly recommend checking them out. So okay. anyway, that's my, that's my weekly update. I'll have to give it a little listen. Yeah. What um, about you, Nick? I, uh, I, 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 uh, <laughs> I've not been up to anything too much, but I will say, um, the one interesting thing I did this week was I invested in a startup, Oh. uh, which is quite a, I, I don't know. I, I don't think it's really related to design, but like, hey, maybe it's something you guys are interested in investing. Obviously, yeah. uh, there's some legal stuff that like I have to say, like I'm not a financial advisor or whatever. But uh, I think a couple of years ago in in the U.S., they changed the rules um, where you could now invest in a startup um, via crowdfunding, oh, which is a new thing. Because before you could only invest if you were an accredited investor, which means that you're like a millionaire. Right. They only let millionaires invest in startups, which is, I mean, it sounds bad at first, but then you think about it, you probably don't want, you know, every, everyday Joes losing their money on startups. Right. Startup investing is like gambling, essentially. Yeah. So, but uh, but the, the, the crowd sourced or the crowdfunding company is called Republic. I can link to it too. I got it. I think there's a promo code. So use my promo code if you guys check it out. But if you guys are interested in like investing and, and stuff like that, check it out. Um, I don't know. Well, they got some clean vectors on this website, so you know it's legit. <laughs> yes, it's got that startup y vibe to it. It's a startup, startup inception. Um, I don't know. Something, something not design related that you guys can look at if you're interested. Yeah. Um, I also, this week, I green screened VR over myself. I saw with, that. With a webcam. I posted it on Instagram. And, um, I don't know. It's kind of a cool new, a cool new way to show off the the tool. I actually pretty much hacked Instagram to live stream VR, green screened, it, it, to to everyone's phones. How do you do that? Oh, I just watched a ton of YouTube videos, and I had to download all these programs, and then I also had to like open up the command prompt. You know, you know, like on the Windows oh, computer no. when you open up command prompt, it looks like you're hacking into the computer. <laughs> Um, you went deep. Yeah, and then I had to give away my password to some Russian guy, and so far it's been great. I haven't <laughs> had any issues. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. It was kind of cool. It was a fun little little experiment. Yeah, that's crazy. I saw you did a helicopter. <laughs> what the heck was that about, Nick? Oh, we had to air our little beef. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, is this for doing those couple chair concepts like a year ago? I had to get back. Let's see. You're going to tread on my turf? Or I'm going to tread on your turf. Here's um, here's Nick's helicopter. If you're watching the YouTube, yeah. So I, I sketched. So this was during a live stream. I just yeah. screen recorded. And that I was, is, I mean, that is pretty awesome. The the whole thing. Yeah. If you guys aren't watching, it's essentially gravity sketch overlaid onto real life me. So it's not the other way around. It's not like mm-hmm. real life me inside gravity sketch. Yeah. Um, I, it gives it gives a good perspective on just how the tool works and how you use it. I think yeah. a lot of times when people see just the sketching they kind of think like oh isn't that kind of hard to like know the depth perception and like where to where the sketch goes yeah but when you see it in real life you understand like 
it's actually there in three dimensions. So it's not that hard. Right. Um, I know it was, it was fun. And yeah, I, uh, someone suggested doing a helicopter. And so I went down the toy helicopter route and, uh, yeah, I tried it on your let's, turf, James. Let's, let's, uh, <laughs> let's cast some votes. Who did it better? Well, you gotta, you gotta vote on, Oh, this helicopter. That's pretty similar to my helicopter too. <laughs> Subconsciously. So, so we need, we need your, we need you to weigh in. Yeah. So James Who, has a helicopter that looks similar to the one I did in VR or you have a helicopter that looks similar to the one that I did. All right. Either way, <laughs> we'll put it up on a vote, uh, and you guys can decide. We'll let the uh, the people decide on who did it better. Decision 2019. Who did it better? We'll ha- we'll be having debates on CNN. <laughs> who uh, did the better helicopter? Starting in September. Oh man. Um, leading up to the vote for who will become the president of IDSA. Yes. That all you have to do is submit a helicopter design and you can become president. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that's pretty, I mean, that is pretty sweet. Yeah. You've, I mean, that's uh, that's a lot of investment that's paid off or time investment yeah. figuring out the hack. I would say it took me five hours to figure it out. Like just to get up and live running on a live stream. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I don't know. Always, always be experimenting, I guess. Yeah, for sure. Um, and buy a pin, for God's sakes. Oh, yeah. We have some pins. Um, oh, I forgot. Here, pull, it out, pull it out for you guys in the video. Run, Nick. Run. It's right here. <laughs> <laughs> He's got it. Um, so, yeah. You guys know the deal. We, yeah. uh, we sell pins for your uh, coat or what, book bag. Or- do we have any new... We've been we've been shouting people out. Do we have any new oh new I'm, purchases? I'm just saving up. I think it'd be instead of like shouting a couple of people. Oh, out week, it's I like see. Maybe a monthly shout out. Yeah, yeah. If you buy a pin, we'll we'll shout you out every month. I mean, it's going to be difficult to shout out the last million people that that bought a pin. Right. Last episode, it was crazy. We sold it, three thousand. <laughs> we had to make last episode a four parter just to get through. <laughs> All of the thank yous, but but uh, sincerely, we thank anybody who donates to buy a pin. I mean, it is going; it's funneling into all of this you see here, right? Because we've got new mics, we've right. got new audio equipment. I actually did buy new socks from the other day. Really? Yeah. There was one episode where you held up my foot, yeah, and showed off your holy socks. I mean, that's good incentive, socks. you know. But now my shoes are getting holes in them, so it's the new shoe fund. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we need like a chart in the back, like one of those red line charts, and oh, we like, like the fill thermometer, it up. like yeah, the thermometer. The thermometer to fill it up for when uh, Nick gets new. We need new shoes. We okay? need we, we need, need Nick's feet in shoes. <laughs> yes, I've been walking barefoot in New York. It's it's a bad look for sure. Um, we don't need a de- we don't need an industrial design martyr on our hands, people. <laughs> um, speaking of just. I guess brainstorming ideas. Yeah. We wanted to have a little, little new segment where we just come up with stuff and you guys also come up with stuff with us. But of course this will be not right now. You'll have to email it in or send it in. Yes. But, but um, yeah, we just want to get some feedback on the podcast. Let us know what you guys think. I think mainly from our side, we want to see, I guess what we guys, what we can, I don't know, build for you guys or some ways of kind of mixing it up or getting you guys involved. Yeah. I know one, one idea James and I had, and I know it's been talked about a little bit on the discord is like a minor details challenge. Right. And I don't know if you have any ideas for that, James, this is kind of like a live brainstorm sesh. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, we have such, we have so many creative people in the community and people that are listening to this podcast week after week. And we have seen before where people have done projects that are inspired off of the podcast. And especially in the Discord, I feel like there's a lot of exchanging of ideas and getting critiques and, you know, putting putting uh, our creative work out there. Nick and I will post stuff that we're working on and get feedback. Other people uh, will do the same. And it's it's really fun. But we were thinking, like, how do we like, should we make this into some sort of Like, should we have a minor details design challenge? And like, you know, and also thinking about the pin, would it be cool to do something where somebody submits a design for, for merchandise? uh, And then 
we would sell that merchandise. Right. Um, like we would make it and then, I don't know, give them, give them a piece or something. Give yeah. Them a- give them a piece, give them a prize. We could also do more of a traditional kind of design challenge. Kind yeah. Of, kind of like a render weekly type of deal where we, we pick a topic. Maybe it's like a monthly thing. Yeah, or, but and I then the review their work or what I feel like I don't know what do you think would be more you know the most appropriate for us is because like you know I feel like within the podcast we dive deep into a lot of these topics and we're kind of scratching our heads about sort of big big picture ideas around industrial design right so instead of challenges like hey design design a a, a random thing a speaker design right. whatever you know I think it would be interesting to to say like, okay, you know, we think that like, we think this about design or we've talked about this, this idea around design. Now we want to see how you oh, interpret that. That's interesting. Because so instead of like, instead of picking a, picking a object, we're, we're picking like an episode or something or, or just like an idea that we talked about yeah. in depth. Yeah. So like a couple episodes ago, we were talking about what designers like versus what consumers like. Mm. And maybe how do you marry those two things? Yeah. And to make something that is hopefully like satisfies the designer part of yourself, but also is something that will appeal to the, you know, the moms out there, the moms and the dads of America. <laughs> yeah, my mom. My mom wants what you guys design too. Um, so, you know, I think I think it would make more sense for us to do challenges like that 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 take kind of a bigger bite out of something that we've discussed right. on the podcast. I like that idea. Um, so I don't know. I mean, if if there are listeners out there who who have ideas about certain things that we've talked about that could make for good design challenges and certainly will go back and look at what we've done. But I, I don't know, Nick, it, is there, is there something else that I, I do like what you're saying about, um, having people send in ideas that are around our episodes. I also think, I guess going on the merch idea, like would it be, it'd be cool if we designed like more like, like I I don't want people to send in like a shirt design. Right. Like I think it'd be cool if they sent in a a product design. Right. And we actually made it. Yeah. I mean, depending on the complexity. Well, what would would be really cool is like, like what's a product? We, we have somebody submit a product. We, we get it made. And then we talk about, we talk about the process on the podcast of how we, how we got it made we interview the person that did the design, you know, to talk to them about how they came up with it. And this is good. This is good stuff. <laughs> Live brainstorming right here. I think a pen would be a really good object. A pen? Because yeah. it's a, it's fairly simple. Right. And then also it does relate to the design. Yeah. And I've also always wanted to make a pen. Or pe- a pen. But this wouldn't be you, Nick. Well. This would be a listener designing a pen. I'm just getting excited. <laughs> A listener's pen. Uh, that that's a cool idea. Okay. Well, let let us know what you guys yeah. think. I mean, and these are just we're just spitballing here. Yeah. I mean, a pen might be might be challenging because there are because we have pins and now we have pens oh, and it's going to be a really hard <laughs> distinction to make. Buy our pins and our pens, people. We've got pens. And we're, we're and... also we're also coming out with skillets, but we're going to call them pans. <laughs> We got pins, pens, and pans, people. <laughs> and James is full of puns, so we can go the whole gamut. Oh my god, <laughs> we're gonna fill our pans with pins and pens. So buy them, buy them all. We'll fill them to the top of the, we'll fill to the top of the pan with pins and pens. Uh, but we, I, I feel like the thing with pens is how do you design a pen, considering that a lot of pens are made with like injection molded parts. Well, that's why you guys got to buy a pen so we can get enough money to get a pen. <laughs> we'll we'll think about this and we want to hear your thoughts yeah. on like like what what a good challenge might be. Um, but I think I think that would be really cool. Another thing we've been thinking about as well is doing some sort of like live stream callathon. Mm. I mean, we've we talked about it a few times on the podcast, but doing like a what do they what do you call them? a phonathon? <sighs> Marathon? I, I, I don't I, I don't know think... what it is. I think it is it a Tel- telethon. 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 
Um, but you know, obviously do it in the 21st century. Yeah. Um, we're getting Oprah Winfrey in here. <laughs> uh, Sophia Vergara. We're, we've got, uh, David Spade, uh, yeah. Adam Sandler's coming in. James is Googling. It's going to be a big, it's going to be a big telethon. Okay. Um, yeah. So we thought we'd do some, I mean, it's, it's been an idea that we've had of doing like a 12 hour. I'd be down for 24 hour. 24 hours just where we live stream the entire thing and then also bring in like guests and then do like mini sketch sessions or something like that i don't know who's gonna come to this studio at like three in the morning to like guest spot well, yeah i don't know what happens between like three in the morning and like we actually sleep live <laughs> uh, but uh yeah i think that would be pretty cool you know we know we know a lot of people in the New York area, some of which we've been trying to, to get onto the podcast, but also some old friends, get people in here, but also have it be a chance for people to call in yeah. and talk to us live on the air. And then that also be a platform for, you know, if you feel like it to donate to the podcast. Right. Um but yeah, you know, we're just, uh, we're trying to build this. We, we have this amazing community yes. together. Uh, like, you know, especially what I, from what I can see on the Discord. And to tap into that community to do some really interesting things. I, I think that's like, that's something that we've been really curious about for a while and trying to figure out what the right approach is. For sure. Um and so I think I think we got some good ideas there. I think we just need to hear hear what people think. Yeah, let us know. Um, and if you guys have other ideas as well, I mean, even if it's like if you have ideas for other content or anything else you want us to do, let us know. We thought this would be a little brainstorm sesh. Um, and even you know if you are listening and you work for a company that is in the design industry and could possibly be a sponsor, yeah, you know, we would love to have a sponsor as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, send us an email, minor details podcast at gmail.com. Listen, Nick or, or needs get on the Gmail. Shoes. Or, yes, I need shoes. He or, needs shoes. I need the shoes. Wait, is there an actual hole in your shoe right now? Uh, there's there's like a hole in the it's, oh it's, it's my starting to come apart. God, are you kidding me? Look at this. It's, it's definitely coming apart. We've do we know anybody at the creator farm? We we need some Adidas stat. I think this one's actually coming apart even more. How often do you wear these shoes, Nick? Every day. I only you're supposed pair. you're supposed to let your feet you're supposed to let your shoes is that like a thing? air out. I didn't see that in directions. Yeah, Are there directions here. There's a a, a quote. I, this is this is not going to be a direct quote from a British comedy called Coupling, which is basically British Friends. But they they talk about men and shoes, and they they say that like men just let their feet marinate, basically. <laughs> Because, because oftentimes men, unless you're like a, you know, sneaker head, you have like two right. pairs of shoes. Right. It's funny. I saw on Karam's uh, stories, he was like, the average American has 10 shoes. And I'm like, no, that is totally, that average is blown out by those like. The, the people who by the people answered who the question. Have, who have hundreds <laughs> oh, of I shoes. Okay, yeah. You know, like the real, you know, the real sneaker heads. Right, there's 99 people that have three pairs, and then there's that one percent of people that have like 100 pairs. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I think I don't know how many how many pairs of shoes do you have? I have two pairs that are like wearable, and then I have a pair of boots for snow. I guess I have like six or seven. Yeah, maybe eight. <laughs> James, you turn. Maybe your, I do have ten. You turn into a sneakerhead, man. No, I mean, I have dress shoes and stuff. I got to go to... You know. I don't have dress shoes, but I do have Vans. Those are pretty dressy. <laughs> if you dress them up. <laughs> How do you They're expect to get any sort of investors when you don't even have a pair of I'm, dress shoes? I don't need investors. I'm the one investing, James. Oh, Check out my link on Republic. I see. Anyway, we should probably get into a topic at this point. Uh, yes. <laughs> right? Uh, so we had a great uh, suggestion on the Discord from Chris Ferentz, and his suggestion was... Could we get an episode on all the people that have influenced each of your design careers? What were the influential moments and people that changed your course? That is a 
big question, Chris. That is a huge question. And, you know, we could go through every single person that we met. I mean, technically, they probably have influenced you at some degree. Yeah. But uh, this, this is uh, this is my time to shout out some people, James. You're always shouting people out. Go for it, Nick. I'm um, going to sit back and relax. And enjoy <laughs> the story. No, I, I think I, I think there's like certainly those people that stand out in everyone's life that kind of really shaped who they are. And it always starts from childhood, you know, even, even in like elementary middle school, obviously your parents are a huge influence. Um, for me, at least in the design side of things, I got to give credit to my grandfather. Uh, he was an architect and I've, I'm sure I've mentioned it before, but, um, yeah, it's just, it, it's great to think back on, on our time together and, and see how he was always teaching me things and how he was you know, taking me into the wood shop, um, and showing me how to build things. I remember this one story where it kind of clicked, clicked for us. Um, you know, I didn't know what industrial design was until I got to college, but I remember being in the wood shop when I was like, maybe, I don't know, eight or something. Mm -hmm. Um, and we were building this like soccer ball game where you have like these marbles and you drop the marbles down and it hit a ping pong ball. Hmm. It's, I, I don't know what the game's called. You could probably Google it. But we were just building our own out of wood because, I don't know, it's a fun project to do. And I remember there was this, like, unique problem of, like, how do we slope the end of the field so that you can get your marbles back? And I'm, a, like, an 8-year-old kid. Like, I don't know how to solve this problem. This is way over my head, uh. right? But, you know, my, my grandfather was like, Nick, you know, take a pad of paper and a pen and just try to sketch it out. Yeah. And so we were both sketching there, both my grandfather and I. He was obviously figuring it out as well. Um, and then we compared drawings, and we had the same solution. And it was like, oh. oh, it was just like clicked. It was like, oh, maybe, maybe this is like something that I'm good at or like, that's cool. I have a knack for. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. That was a fun little story. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, obviously it goes into like high school. I remember I had an art teacher. Um, I think I, I would guess that art teachers are pretty influential in high school as well. I, my whole family's teachers. I feel like teachers are a big influence on you because you're just so moldable at, when you're young. Right. Um, but yeah, I had our professor, Mr. Styles. He always was showing me how to paint and things like that. I don't really necessarily remember any specific stories, but I do remember during that class was the very first time I ever built something that was like functional. Mm. Um, before, you know, before it was like there's art and then there's like, I don't know, no, nothing else. Like you just paint like creative stuff is painting and drawing. Right. But he opened my eyes to the fact that like, Oh wait, you can do a logo or you can build something. The first thing I built was this lamp and I've never talked about it. And I don't even know if I have a, actually I probably could dig up a photo of it really long time ago. Uh, but it was a lamp that I had, I had taken a bunch. I had found a bunch of like electrical qu cords or something like that. Yeah. Um, and I cut off all the plugs of them and had all the plugs sticking up and then had one light bulb in the center sticking up above the plugs. I don't know. It was just a weird art project. Right? <laughs> as well as art. And then I painted everything black. It, it looked weird. I had it for a long time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, those were definitely my at least early, early development influences in my design career. Right. Um, I don't know if you have any... Any thoughts on your early year? Like early years, foundational years? Or maybe, I mean, it doesn't even have to be like design related. I mean. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, like when it comes to parents, I definitely got encouragement and inspiration from both of my parents in different ways. Like, I, I mean, my mom was the first person to like notice that I was, you know, really getting into just drawing in general. And so she started buying me sketchbooks. And so I was constantly drawing. Like I, I like vividly remember, and sometimes I would just like grab a ream of like Copy. computer paper yeah. and I can remember going to like Outback Steakhouse and just like drawing in the booth the entire time. Man, Outback, um, good, good memories. It's really strange thinking back because I was always iterating. Like I never, the thing was, is that like I often never brought something to like 
a finished the, thing? A finished conclusion. Oh, like, that's interesting. I, I was always, when I was drawing, I was drawing completely new ideas. And most of the time it was superheroes. Like I was always drawing superheroes and I would draw like completely different superheroes all the time. I did make some comics when I was like in this stage. Um, but I quickly realized that it wasn't something that I was really all that interested in. And then I got into music and, um, I interned in high school cause there was, did you have high school internship? I had like an apprenticeship type of thing. Yeah. There was this producer that my dad got me in touch with a music producer. Cause I was kind of into music at the time and his name was Justin Paul and he, um, he gave me these CDs that he made of tutorials okay. of of like how to record in GarageBand and all these things. And, you know, I just started making music in GarageBand on my computer and like learned all of these really valuable tricks. And one of which was to like record with this looping feature in GarageBand. So you like, you set a beat or something like that. And it just loops over and over. Right, and that was, right. it was also this iterative process of like... Rap, you could rap over it. Oh, yeah. Rapped hardcore. Lay down some sweet bars. I only made explicit rap songs. <laughs> like, like disgustingly explicit. <laughs> Mom, we won't let you listen to that. No. But, um, but no, it was, like, it was like, okay, like, you know, what does is, what is the bass line sound like? And lay that down and then like start to like lay down melodies over that with the guitar or chords or whatever. And that was also this like iterative process of like, okay, that doesn't work. Let's tweak this. Like, Mm. you know, it was, it's, it is interesting looking back at my life, how much iteration I was always doing. And with the music thing, I was getting into this process of like completing things. I would complete songs and, and, um, and finish them out. So that was... I, I don't know. I do feel like that had a profound effect on me. And music just in general has always had a profound effect on me. I can remember in high school hearing the the Flaming Lips album, Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots. Okay. I don't know if you know this album. It has the song Do You Realize on it, which okay. is a very famous Flaming Lips song. Um, and it literally, like... I had never heard anything like it and it inspired me to make all of this stuff that I just, that I never, you know, M- music. I, I would not Music-wise. know, uh, in my art class. Oh, interesting. Like I didn't. So the music inspired you to do art? Yeah. The music inspired me. I was taking AP art my senior year and like I, you know, you had to like pick a project to do and I was doing this like t-shirt design thing and then. I heard this album and I completely reformatted and started making these like paper models of like little scenes, like sort of like right. almost, almost like set design. Right. Right. And, and it purely came out of the inspiration from this album. That's interesting. So it was that, that has happened multiple times in my life where like I hear a piece of music and it inspires me to do things. I mean, definitely that's, I mean, a common, a common thread yeah. that, that I've heard as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I am just kind of curious how, how that would translate to industrial design though. Mm. Like you definitely hear it a lot in art of music being an inspiration and influencing a artist to, you know, paint in a certain way. Yeah. Uh, but how does that work in industrial design? I mean, it's, it's harder because of all the constraints. Yeah. And especially because like, I feel like the one thing that's kind of unfortunate about industrial design is like there's not much of a spirit of experimentation when it comes to colors. Mm, Yeah, we are afraid of colors for sure. And I mean that, you know, it's something, it's a complaint that we've, that we've leveled a couple times of just like, you can't really take immense risks. Right. Because there's money on the line. Did you ever, have you ever heard the story about the, um, the Dell pink laptop. I don't think so. Uh, I, I, and I don't know the story verbatim, but essentially I would say this was like early two thousands. Uh, there was, and I might've heard this from like a conference or something. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe it was the designer at Dell was, was talking about this, but they were talking about how 
you know, all computers, and this is kind of like the Apple computer too. Right. The, the iMac G3, which came in colorful uh, array of, of, of hues. And at Dell, obviously Dell is a bit more conservative in their colors, and they always had black or gray computers. But the designer wanted to do a colored version for this season. And, you know, the the general idea was to go with something that was also pretty universal, maybe blue, a navy, um, maybe maybe even a red. But he was like, no, no, we should not, we should not do these colors. What we should do is pink. And there was not a lot of data to prove that pink was going to be a hot selling color. Huh. Uh, so he just kind of went on a gut to just kind of knowing that it was maybe a very polarizing color, but also polarizing in a good way. Like right. There could be a lot of people that are attracted to pink. Um, and they sold this pink computer and it was like, it sold out way more than even the black did. Really? Um, it was kind of just one of these like initial, initial run of computers that was, was kind of out there. And I don't know the exact one. I mean, obviously there's plenty of pink computers now, but, yeah. um, it was just that story of like going out and taking a risk of making this very polarizing color and it paid off. That's pretty amazing. I wish I knew the exact story, but, uh. I know it was, it was interesting. It's it's very cool. I mean, I think that there. I think the one of the inspirations to be gained from music is just like this idea that people are putting themselves out there personally to mm. be adopted, like, and and for then that music to be successful to a wide audience. Yeah, because it's something that we've been talking about and something that I've been thinking about is just this idea of like, we're constantly being told and designed to like, to tone back our personalities, right? Like what we would want to see in a product right. versus like what the market would want to see because we're not, you know, we shouldn't design for ourselves. But I do, I do wonder sometimes if people like that personal connection, like they like yeah. that feeling like this is, this was made by an individual right. for me. Yeah, I think there's definitely a balance there to strike. But Nick, what what happened once you went to school? What happened once you went to college? Um, in terms of like influential people, I yeah. got I got to give it to Owen Foster. He was one of my favorite professors at at SCAD. Um, he was just influential, just in the way that he always talked about design and you know, and and taught his classes. I remember. I guess this is more of the influential moments. One of the biggest influ influential moments was my first studio class that I had with Owen, and um, I designed the Nightlight, which we've talked about uh, on previous episodes. But right. it really, it really changed my my whole perspective on design. And and I don't know if I had, uh, you know, the, the just the general idea of the project was to design a nightlight that was uh, inspired by a certain designer, a certain famous designer. And my designer was not to Fukusawa. And, you know, I studied his philosophy pretty intense, intensely and designed this like tilting lamp that turned on when you just tilted it. Right. And it went viral. And, um, it just kind of reshaped my mind of, of, I guess the type of design that I liked. Mm. And it's kind of interesting. It's always interesting to think about these moments and to think back and, uh, you know, just, play around and imagine if you changed, you know, one little piece of the scenario, like what happens if it was, if I didn't get to design a light and we had to design more and a more obscure or unrelatable object, like a, a hedge trimmer, <laughs> like I don't think it would have gone as viral and I don't think I would have been shaped by that. Right. Um, or, or even if it was a different designer, like if I had to design a light that was inspired by Dieter Rams, it definitely wouldn't have been as, uh, interactive or playful. Interesting. So it's it's those like small moments that you think back and you're like, wow, that could. There's so many ways that this could go. Yeah. So so are you saying that like since then, you you feel like did it shape? I, you know, did it shape the mindset from like? Was it the starting point for your evolution of the way that you approach design? I think it was. I think it was. Um, I mean, this was a whole. And how did Owen contribute to that? Well, I guess Owen contributed in other ways, but I mean, you know, he just led the the class 
I mean, o- Owen Foster contributed to me just by instilling in in all of the students that uh, I think we kind of talked about this. We might have talked about this, but that you know, working hard is better than talent. Mm. Hard, hard work is better than talent. I think mm. we had a whole episode on that. Um, I, I think that was like a big thing that he pushed of like, hey, like you can be the most talented person in the world, but if you don't work hard and you don't dedicate your time. Right. You know, it's, it's worthless. Um, and it, you know, it's just like that whole ethos and you know, the way that he talked about design and made us come up with our own ideas instead of giving us the answers. Right. I think really helped because specifically on this project, um, I had gone through the whole process of designing it. Um, and I had come up with this triangular form that tilted back and forth and it was just a basic prism, like a basic, basic triangle. Right. And I, you know, he, he was saying that there was something wrong with it. And I was like, well, what's wrong with it? And he was like, I don't know. You got to figure that part out. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, it doesn't seem like a very helpful thing to do. But in retrospect, it was the most helpful thing because I wouldn't have discovered it on my own. Like, right. the, the whole issue was if it's just a triangle, how does someone know to turn it on or off? Mm. Like, if someone's never seen this object before and it's just a triangle, like, what do you do? You don't, I mean, there's no, there's no information to, right. to tell the user to come and touch it. So this led me down this route of like, oh, well, I'll just put it on off. I'll just, I'll just write on and off on one, one, both of the sides. Oh um, no. But then he like realized, like, he's like, no, there's a, there's many ways to indicate oh. on and off. So, yeah. you know, Owen's great at kind of leading people to their own solutions. And yeah. the end of the, uh, in the end, I decided to just put this little finger depression on one side, mm-hmm. which, you know, indicates that you should put your finger there and depress it. Yeah. Um, so it's like that kind of thing that I guess influenced me is like, like letting people learn and not, not giving them the answers and not lead. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think that is an underrated skill in being a teacher. Right. Cause there's lots of professors that will just be like, yeah, this is, you're not, you're not doing it right. You should do it like this. Right. Instead of you're not doing it right now. How, how do you think you should do it? Right. Yeah. Um, I know. Now that, that makes a lot of sense. But yes, I do think once I got, it's also a little bit, and maybe it's to my detriment because it did go viral that I felt like I was always chasing that. Mm. So subconsciously, I'm not like actively trying to make something viral, but I think the, the reason something goes viral is also the reason that, you know, it also has some correlation to being a very understandable and relatable design. Yeah. Can I ask you another question yes. is, is this the first project that you started using the GIF animations? Yes. Also, how how did you stumble across this idea? Uh, and this was I did this project in 2012. Yeah. Um, and I do I do recall that it was a very early on technique of using GIFs. Like, yeah. You know, we use GIFs all the time nowadays, but in 2012 it was not as common. I'm sure there's plenty of GIFs in 2012, but. In product design, it was really rare, and I honestly cannot remember how I came up with it. I mm. I just remember taking the photos and I was like, "Oh, what if we did a GIF where we tilted it back and forth? That would yeah. make so much sense." Yeah, I mean, it's a brilliant storytelling device. And I remember when I first stumbled across your work and I saw that, I was like, "Man, that is like, it's it's just a, such a brilliant and also really intriguing." way to illustrate how something's how something works i think that's also what led it to become viral is that you could watch this two second gif right and you understood the entire concept the entire design you understood every single element of it exactly um there's there's something there's something so satisfying about motion that like can't be understated you know yeah it's just kind of like well, they say a picture's worth a thousand words. A, right. gift's, a gift's worth like a million. Yes. <laughs> right? A gif is a gift <laughs> of a million words. Um, but yeah, I, that's, that's, such a, that's such an awesome project and uh, the, the light. And it seems pretty foundational to, to your approach. Yeah. I mean, this is the project that I also formed familiarism with mm. that, I, that I had in my mind. Um, yeah. So yeah, I don't know. That was definitely a pivotal point in my 
in my design career, just that first that first design project, which I'm sure is a pivotal point for a lot of people. Yeah, just doing the fir- the thing for the first time. Right. Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, we're we could talk about some more influencers and stuff. Do you have any like influential moments, or also maybe I kind of want to talk about maybe influential famous designers. Mm. I mean, I talk about Nato Fukusawa. We've talked about Japs for Morrison at length. I don't know if you have any. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing that I was always struggling with in school was this idea that I, f- I felt, I felt a bit inadequate among some of my peers because I wasn't a maker. Like I wasn't that mm. like kind of maker person. Right. And I was like, can I, can I really call myself a designer if I'm like, you know, not comfortable in the shop. And I certainly did as much as I could to, to like get into the shop and get my hands dirty and like get into that whole process. And I think like I can tap into that side of myself, but it's not always, it's not always easy. Right. Um, but you know, and I, and, and I'm still working, working my way through that anxiety with, uh, like the whole brace makes things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. But the, the thing is, is like, when I was in school, it was when I first became aware of Benjamin Hubert and I, he was very influential on me. Um, first of all, he did this stool or this chair, uh, that, you know, considering that my dad has the rotomolding molding company, right. Um, you know, I was always wondering about rota molded furniture and I never really liked the the furniture that was just plastic. Just plastic. It just didn't seem very elevated. And I saw this chair from Benjamin Huber. Wow, this is beautiful and chair. It's a really beautiful chair. And it's a rota molded top piece, like seat and back, and then wooden legs going into the rota molded piece and a metal strut. It's very elegant. It it, it seems a lot more slim than a traditional rota molded product yeah i think also the colors are really nice as well oh they're beautiful i feel like the problem with rota molding is a lot of times it seems very vibrant there's a lot of vibrant colors in Mm -hmm. rota molding well the cool thing about rota molding uh, i'm gonna sell rota molding for a second here um the cool thing about it is that unlike injection molding or blow molding or anything like that where you're doing long runs of things like you have to basically select a color and that that's the color for thousands of pieces. Right. But with rotomolding, molding, it's like every time that arm comes around, you can dump a new color in. Oh. So like you can generate a lot of different colors, whereas with other processes, like you kind of have consigned yourself to one or two colors. That is interesting. So it is it's a valuable part of that process. I'm calling up a rotomolding molding factory right now, actually. <laughs> I know a guy. But um one one of the things is that I think like Benjamin Hubert was kind of a precursor to like the Jamie Wolfond, the Visibility Studio, that kind of thing, where he was he was really process forward. He mm. was going to factories and and understanding the process and then building products around the process. Right. Um, he also you know he had the small studio vibe going on, but like with a with a big voice. Um, and this was before he started Layer. This was before Layer. Okay. And the other thing that I really liked about him was I once saw this interview with him where he was talking about, like somebody was asking him, they were like, uh, I think it might have been about his thesis project or something. And, and they were like, oh, and, and you made it yourself? And he was like, no, I, I worked with other people to get it made. Like, that's what you do as an industrial designer. Right. It's like you you collaborate with people like that are better than you at whatever it is that they do. And you make, you make pieces that way. It's not, it's not about this. Like I am the everything of this. That is truly the being a maker. Whereas, you know, he was talking about being an industrial designer. And I think that that unlocked a lot for me and, and kind of released me from a lot of, a lot of my insecurities because I was like, Oh, you know, I feel like I'm good at this iteration thing and I'm good at this sort of like holistic vision. Right. But like when it comes to like, you know, getting things made and getting things made well, I would rather rely on the expertise of others. For sure. Um, For sure. So yeah, that was, that was pretty influential on me. But what about you aside from Naoto? Well, 
you know, Jasper Morrison, again, I, I always talk about him, famous British designer. I think, you know, I, I only read his, his book two years ago, a year ago, mm-hmm. um, or one of his books. Uh, it's called A Book of Things. But, you know, I, I was on this track of this nod to Fukusawa, like really playful, kind of almost quirky aesthetic um, for, for a while. I mean, even into my career at, at Petmate, you know, designing these like, I mean, obviously designing dog toys is really playful, so it kind of fit. Yeah. Um, but I felt like Jasper Morrison reeled me back in because mm. Jasper Morrison was all about, hey, like, you know, just let the design be. Like, mm. Just step back for a second. You don't have to add all this superfluous stuff. Right. Just just imagine if the design was just itself. What yeah. Would it, what would it be in of, in of, of itself? Yeah. And so I really love that combination of, of like, Natsukasawa's, like, fun, quirky side and then Jasper Morrison's pulling it back. I feel like it's a nice juxtaposition. Yeah. Um, so that's where I find myself now in terms of like influential moments. Um, yeah. You know, the one thing that I was thinking about after our conversations about, uh, about what consumers like versus what designers like, I actually feel like in terms of contemporary designers, Jasper Morrison is one of the better ones in terms of furniture of making like live like living furniture right like, you can see it in your house because i think that he really admires like the mundane yes and and the things that that he grew up with right. or, or things that other people have within their homes and so he makes things that feel they feel like lived in a bit like yeah. they feel I don't know. There's there's something very comfortable and almost I don't know if retro is the right word, but there there is something about them where they feel they feel right in a home. Yeah, I I think there's definitely that distinction there. I, I'm glad you touched on that, James, because it's it's not the fact that Jasper Morrison is beca- like kind of pulling back and being minimal. It's the fact that Jasper Morrison is is pulling back and letting the design be a, the design. Like, right. Just let it be natural. You know, let it be, feel like it's supposed to be in the, the room, feel yeah. like it's li- livable. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess the last like influential piece obviously is our friends. <laughs> I got to say, James, you've influenced me a, a tremendous amount. I have? Well, just certainly influential moments. I mean, I think to, to date we've built, we've built some pretty cool stuff together. Yeah, I would, I would say that too. And, um, no, of course, I, I feel the same. I mean, that's that's one of the reasons that I reached out to you in the first place was because I felt I felt your like there was something about your work that was definitely speaking to me in a way that that not a lot of the other work on Instagram was, and I feel like my approach to that, and then since working with you, I feel like I've adopted a bit of your approach yeah. into my work. Yeah, same and. Like that, you know, that is the, that's the thing about life is, you know, I think, I think maybe a good way to kind of summarize this entire conversation is to, is to say that like your life is this, this elaborate painting and it's not just one stroke. Right. Like there's not, there's not just like one way of, of doing things and that will be the way until you die. Yeah. It's like, a, it's a journey. I feel like the the best designers that I know are constantly pulling from other people, pulling from inspirational sources to evolve like the way that they think about things, the way they approach design and like that. And and that's what is exciting to me is like, is, is meeting those people. Yeah. I love that. Like analogy, just that big canvas and all these little strokes make it up. I mean, I also want to say if you want to be influenced and, and inspired, surround yourself by the people that influence and inspire you. Right. And I, I think that's a defi- definitely something that everyone should do. Yeah. And speaking of that, the Discord's perfect for that. <laughs> it is. Um, <laughs> join the Discord. There's some, there's some sweet people on there. Yeah. No, it's it's totally true. But, you know, we would love to hear, like, you know, your stories of inspiration, who's influenced you and how have they influenced you? That'd be great. Um, We'd love to hear that. Either let us know in the discord or email us at minor details podcast at gmail.com. Um, and, and speaking of our email, we have some questions. We got some questions. Uh, these questions are, are pointed more toward my, uh, 
brand almost object. And so I thought we'd just kind of lump it in and do a little almost object update. But, um, I think there's some points that we can touch on here just generally. Yeah. Um, I don't know which you, Oh, do you, do you want to do this first question? Um, so this question comes from worry and worry says, I know Jamie Wolfon's good thing has been an inspiration for almost object. And he's talked a lot about how he was designing backwards, going to the factory, figuring out, out what could be made s- simply and turned it into a premium thing. When designing, how deep into the business of things do you get? How deep should a designer get? And as a freelancer, as a full-time employee or as a, a side hustle, um, and then Ann Hodgins, Hodg, Hodgson says, can we get an update on Almost Object during the podcast? I know that Nick gives little updates here, but I'm curious to see how it's going. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess maybe just to reiterate, Almost Object is is a design brand that I created, and it's more of a hobby brand mm-hmm. than an actual moneymaker. Like, <laughs> there's not, obviously, I don't, I would say the bottle of I did profit. The mirror I didn't profit. Um, but you know, it's, it's a place for me to create experimental objects that everyone can enjoy. Right. You know, everyone can purchase this. It's a manufactured object. Um, cause a lot of times you see like really cool designs online. You're like, Oh, where can I buy this? But it's really just a Behance project that right. someone did. Someone did for fun. Right. And so like that was kind of my, my target of like, Hey, how can I push an object so far that it, you have to question whether it's an object. Is it an object? Mm. It's an almost object. Mm-hmm. That's like my thesis around it. Um, and so, you know, I, you know, I want to make products for it and I'm working on products for it. Um, so it's a slow process. Obviously making things is difficult. Uh, and, and yeah, I don't know, maybe one day it'll become more of a, a company, but right now it's, it's more of just this little side hustle. Yeah. Which I guess kind of gets at worries question. Um, you know, how, how deep should a designer get into these things? Yeah. It's a little bit of a tough thing. You know, I think about this question and it makes me think of, should I go all in? Because right now I'm, I'm kind of like on the fence about it. Right. Right. Like I'm doing it, but I'm not fully committed to it as I would, you know, as as a, a job. Is there something that would push you to go all in? I think I just love every, I just love design all around. So it, I feel like I would be, if I jumped all in, well, if I jumped all in, I think I would definitely have to be a little bit more business savvy and I'd be doing a lot more business work. Right. But I love design, so I want both and that's the problem. Yeah. And I don't know how to solve that solution. I'm just going to keep writing it out until maybe it figures itself out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I like, I, I like the client side of work and like actually designing, you know, much you know, very, very realistic products and getting them in the hands of thousands of people. Right. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's the, that's the whole point. I mean, I don't know if you have any thoughts on just like how deep you should get into like a side business or a side hustle. It's a, it's a hard thing. Like I'm sure that if I decided to just focus only on almost object and, you know, spend my savings just to, to get it off the ground, I'm sure that I could get pretty far. Like, yeah. I'm sure that if I put hundred percent effort into it, I could get it kicking, but again, it's like, I don't know if I want to be that business guy. Right. I don't know. I'm, I'm, that's where I'm at as an update, but yeah. Yeah. I do wonder, I do wonder about like, you know, this whole idea of going all in, like, do you, do you have to go all in or can you like slowly shift? I think the traditional advice is that you do have to commit hundred percent. Mm. You know, it, I think at some point you have to commit hundred percent if you want it to be a hundred percent like right thing. I know that the guy who created Dilbert, Scott Adams, his, his thing was, he was, he was, he was working on Dilbert and getting it published. But at the same time, until it was successful, he was working at Bell Atlantic. Like he was working full time. And so like it does, and for like 20 years before, before he got to the point where Dilbert was like the, the moneymaker. Right. And I think that's the route I would rather take. Yeah. Is always have it to be the hobby thing. And then if it becomes the moneymaker, then I can jump over. Right. 
because that's the other thing is like there's there's been there's been a lot of studies done from from what I can recall of like if you start to do something that's a passion as your, as your main hobby, you start like it, it kind of depreciates in like how much satisfaction you get from it. Like it, it's just, uh, I don't know. It's just like a feature of that. As soon as, as soon as that's your main gig and that's like your income, right? It gets less exciting. It gets less exciting. And so, yeah, like is, is there, is that just like a, a route? Is that just, a career path of, of always working for different companies, designing things that are maybe more mass market and then doing kind of this like side work. I think there's another aspect, at least in terms of my, my brand almost object that if, if it had to be a money maker, then I'd have to compromise right on something like there, right. either. I would have to make a design that is not almost in, in, you know, my definition of almost, um, or, or, or some other compromise, but you know, the, the whole idea of making these like weird experimental products, but also making them just, just enough to be an actual object. Yeah. Like that's, it's not like a good business model. Like if you want to make a, a successful business, make a successful product and making almost products, is not a successful right. business model. Right. So I feel like if it became a business, it also c- kills the the idea around it yeah. in a way. It I, also, I don't know. It also seems like, you know, talking about Stefan Sagmeister last episode and how he had this idea of like keeping things fresh. It seems like to me and, and something that I also, you know, get to do in my own side projects is like with those projects, you're able to explore things that you can't in your normal job, but then maybe you can fuse, fuse that in or bring that right. in like that freshness into the work that you're doing for the larger clients. Exactly. Um, because you can almost do your own like focus group testing by doing these, doing these like little side projects. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's interesting. I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully there's something there that we discussed. Hopefully. (laughs) Um, shout out of the week, shout out of the week. Uh, we wanted to shout out Mr. Adam McClosey. Instagram right. handles at Adam M I K L O S I underscore design. And he is based, I believe he's based in Budapest. Oh really? Wow. Hungary. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's actually interesting. I have a, a significant amount, you know how on your uh, Instagram or on business Instagram, you can check where your followers are from. Yeah. There's a significant amount in Turkey. Interesting. It's like up there in the, in the rankings. This is Hungary. <laughs> Where's hungry? Are you are you so hungry that you want turkey? Is oh, that how you got there? <laughs> okay, I'm I okay, well, I misspoke. But maybe there's some crossover between Hungary and Turkey. They're pretty close, right? Uh you know I re- I won the geography bowl 3 times in a row when I was in middle school, and now I'm I'm really sad that I didn't know this. Let's see. Let's see how close. Was, uh this is probably not the best way. I should actually just it's pretty close up, to Turkey pull up Google Maps I'm pretty sure Hungary's close to Turkey uh it is oh it's not close it's uh yeah it's kind of oh, in the middle man. it's kind of in the middle of Eastern Europe I feel so foolish now um <laughs> but it's okay you're just so hungry that you want a turkey I, guess I, so. I figured I guess, it out I guess that's the but one of the things that I really love about um Adam's work is his presentation um, it's very, it's very lively. It's kind of like, it's almost, it's, it's got a graphical it's element like to it. It's like high definition notebook pages. Right. You know? And I'm not sure if these are illustrator sketches or renderings. I think there's just like a mixture a mix of, of everything. things. Cause he has these kind of like more concrete renderings of maybe his like, you know, his final design, uh, also, in, I in did, the center. I did like this uh, project he worked on uh, where he 3D printed out these uh, avocado pit um, yeah. floaties. Because I think when you sprout an avocado, you float it in water. Yeah. And he has these kind of like life rafts where these avocados is kind of cute. It's kind of great. I, it's, it, I mean, it's so simple, but very playful. And I and I kind of like, I love the he took, he took art some nice, direction. Yeah, nice photography of it as well. 
but yeah, he, you know, he does these, he does these layouts where, you know, all of the, the valuable stuff or the, the renderings are all in the center. And then as you kind of orbit outward from there, you're getting all of these sort of notes yeah. and little doodles um, and it's just a very lively page and a very exciting page to look at, but not, not overwhelming at the same time. Very good composition skills. Um, so I just wanted to give props to Adam for, for these, these layouts. And I feel like he's also doing this, this shaper project recently with these, with this sled design that he did, which has been fun to watch. Um, and he's made some, he's made some cardboard models and, you know, some, like, I think some actual wooden models, some, some tiny wooden models out that's of cool. this little, small, little bent plywood sleds. That's awesome. So, yeah, I just, uh, you know, I appreciate the spirit of the page and I think like this is the kind of page that gets me excited to like, to post, to post things, um, because there's, there's like a joy to the projects, you yeah. know? Check check him out. We'll link to him, um, and and yeah, give us a uh, give us a five star review on iTunes. Yeah. Um, also, Google has a podcast app now, so instead of Google Play, it's Google Podcasts. Really? Yeah, I discovered that the other day. Okay. Um, cool. I don't know how many listeners listen on Google Podcasts, but I think there was a few. We need to do a survey again. I may, maybe. Do you think that's more of like the international community is on Google Podcast or Spotify is pretty international? I. I guess I don't know if I have the, that much analytics. We need those analytics, Nick. <laughs> For gosh sakes, I'll work on it. Come on. Um, intro and outro by Kiyoshi the Kid. Subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Th- make sure you thumbs up on YouTube too. That helps. Yeah, thumbs up helps. Click that bell yeah. icon to get notifications of when new episodes are out. Um, and yeah, join the Discord. Let us know what you guys thought about this episode. Yeah, absolutely. And we're actually currently live on the Discord, so that is a perk. If you want to listen, being on the Discord, like five days ahead. Yeah, check pretty, out the Discord. It's pretty exciting. All right. Uh, as always, I'm in, at Nick P Baker, and I'm at I Draw and Receipts. Peace out. Later.